Welcome to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio with author, speaker, and your host, Pat Rulo. Finally, someone willing and able to blow the top off hidden healthcare and hospital dangers. She's provocative, upbeat, balanced, fearless, fresh. Pat has over 20 years of experience as a professional public speaker and knows how to approach this important subject with enough humor and wit to keep you informed, entertained, and empowered. Each week you will say, oh, as Pat explores and exposes little-known hospital hazards, delves into the deep waters of dangerous healthcare practices, picks the brains of her good-looking and influential guests to help keep you and your family safe in today's fragmented healthcare system. The program is not intended to replace medical advice from a licensed professional, but rather to encourage you to become a well-informed participant in your health and well-being. And now, your host, Pat Rulo. Today is another exciting day to be listening to this radio show. Why? Because as part of our Summer Just Got Serious guest lineup, we have a treat for you. Our special guest rounds out our hot summer lineup. He has saved thousands of lives by developing a checklist for preventing hospital-acquired infections. Within a three-month period, hospital-acquired infections in a typical ICU intensive care unit in the state of Michigan dropped to zero because of these checklists. And today, we've got the opportunity to find out how. So, you know the drill. Find a cozy seat, unplug all ringing and buzzing devices, hang out the Do Not Disturb sign, and spend the next fascinating and fun-filled hour with us. And now, it's time for the Healthcare Hazard of the Week. With World Heart Day coming up at the end of the month, Coupled with an email I received from a doctor friend in Phoenix, Arizona, and the notification from a close friend that she just experienced a heart attack last week, I thought it smart if I talked about it with you today. My doctor friend in Arizona sent this email. Hi, Pat. I sent this to my family several days ago, but I don't think I sent it to you. This is the best description you will ever hear of a woman's describing her own heart attack. She also explains her sensations and feelings. Perhaps you can share this on your website. Well, I did post this on our website, speakupandstayalive.com, but I'd like to read this woman's story as it explains a lot in a short amount of time. Women rarely have the same dramatic symptoms that men have. You know, the sudden stabbing pain in the chest, the cold sweat grabbing the chest and dropping to the floor that we see in movies. She says, I had a heart attack at about 10.30 p.m. with no prior exertion, no prior emotional trauma that one would suspect might have brought it on. I was sitting all snugly and warm on a cold evening with my purring cat in my lap, reading an interesting story my friend had sent to me and actually thinking, oh, this is the life, all cozy and warm in my soft, cushy, lazy boy with my feet propped up. A moment later, I felt this awful sensation of indigestion when you've been in a hurry and grabbed a bite of sandwich and washed it down with a dash of water and that hurried bite seems to feel like you've swallowed a golf ball going down the esophagus in slow motion and it is most uncomfortable. You realize you shouldn't have gulped it down so fast and needed to chew it more thoroughly and this time drink a glass of water to hasten its progress down to the stomach. This was my initial sensation. The only trouble was that I hadn't taken a bite of anything since about five o'clock. After it seemed to subside, The next sensation was like a little squeezing motions that seemed to be racing up my spine. In hindsight, it was probably my aorta spasms. Was gaining speed as they continued racing up and under my sternum, this fascinating process continued on into my throat and branched out into both jaws. Aha! Now I stopped puzzling about what was happening. We have all read and or heard about pain in the jaws being one of the signals of a heart attack happening, haven't we? I said aloud to myself and to my cat, Dear God, I think I'm having a heart attack. I lowered the footrest, dumping the cat from my lap, started to take a step and fell on the floor instead. I thought to myself, If this is a heart attack, I shouldn't be walking into the next room where the phone is or anywhere else. But on the other hand, if I don't, nobody will know that I need help. And if I wait any longer, I may not be able to get up in a moment. I pulled myself up with the arms of the chair, walked slowly into the next room, and dialed the paramedics. I told her I thought I was having a heart attack due to the pressure building under the sternum and radiating into my jaws. 
I didn't feel hysterical or afraid, just stating the facts. She said she was sending the paramedics over immediately, asked if the front door was near to me, and if so, to unbolt the door and then lie down on the floor where they could see me when they came in. I unlocked the door and then laid down on the floor as instructed and lost consciousness. And I don't remember the medics coming in, their examination, lifting me onto the gurney or getting me into their ambulance or hearing the call they made to the hospital on the way. But I did briefly awaken when we arrived and saw that the radiologist was already there in his surgical blues and cap, helping the medics pull my stretcher out of the ambulance. He was bending over, asking me questions, probably something like, have you taken any medications? But I couldn't make my mind interpret what he was saying or form an answer and nodded off again, not waking up until the cardiologist and partner had already threaded the teeny angiogram balloon up my femoral artery into the aorta into my heart, where they installed two side-by-side stents to hold open my right coronary artery. I know this all sounds like my thinking and actions at home must have taken at least 20 to 30 minutes before calling the paramedics, but actually it took perhaps four to five minutes before the call, and both the fire station and the hospital are only a few minutes away from my home, and my cardiologist was ready to go to the operating room in his scrubs and get going on restarting my heart, which had stopped somewhere between my arrival and the procedure and installing the stents. Why have I written all of this to you with so much detail? Because I want all of you who are so important in my life to know what I learned firsthand. Be aware that something very different is happening in your body, not the usual men's symptoms, but inexplicable things happening until my sternum and jaws got into the act. It is said that many more women die of their first and last heart attack because they didn't know they were having one and commonly mistake it as indigestion. Take some Maalox or other anti-heartburn preparation and go to bed hoping they'll feel better in the morning when they wake up, which doesn't happen. My female friends, your symptoms might not be exactly like mine, so I advise you to call the paramedics if anything is unpleasantly happening that you've not felt before. It's better to have a false alarm visitation than to risk your life guessing what it might be. Note that I said, call the paramedics. And if you can, take an aspirin. Ladies, time is of the essence. Chew the aspirin to get it into your bloodstream as fast as possible. Do not try to drive yourself to the emergency room. You are a hazard to others on the road. Do not have your panicked husband who will be speeding and looking anxiously at what's happening with you instead of the road. Do not call your doctor. He doesn't know where you live, and if it's at night, you won't reach him anyway. And if it's daytime, his assistants or his answering service will tell you to call the paramedics. He doesn't carry the equipment in his car that you need to be saved. The paramedics do, principally oxygen, that you need as soon as possible. Your doctor will be notified later. Don't assume it couldn't be a heart attack because you have normal cholesterol count. Research has discovered that a cholesterol elevated reading is rarely the cause of a heart attack, unless it's unbelievably high and or accompanied by high blood pressure. Let's be careful and be aware. The more we know, the better chance we survive. And this is me talking now. And I'd like to clarify the aspirin situation. We're talking about brands such as Bayer, Bufferin, and Ecotrin. You can take aspirin to help you during a heart attack. After you call 911 or other emergency services, the operator may tell you to chew one adult strength or two to four low-dose aspirin, or you might be given aspirin in the ambulance or emergency room. Aspirin slows blood clotting, so a blood clot that is causing the heart attack stays smaller. So I encourage you, whether you are a man or a woman, to know the signs of heart trouble and to be prepared to take the correct action. If you feel any of the symptoms or you just have a weird or different feeling, it's better to check it out right away and be embarrassed to perhaps find that it's nothing rather than to be cool and die. And if you'd like to share the article with friends, you can find this at the speakupandstayalive.com website. And if you do not have internet access and you want the article, call me and I will mail it to you. 440-725-5462. And with that, let's hear some legal news you can use. We received a legal question from one of our listeners last week, and I think it best that we get the right answer from our friends at Schraff and King. So let's get Allison on the phone, a smart and friendly attorney who always takes the time to help.
Shraf and King, this is Allison. Hi, Allison. It's Pat from Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. Hi, Pat. We have a quick question for you. Do you have a moment? I always have a moment for you. Yay, thank you. All right, Clara63 wants to know, my husband is in the hospital on a breathing tube. I know he would want this, but my brother-in-law and the doctor say no. We do not have any written directives of his wishes. Can the doctor and my husband's brother override my decision? Your husband's brother certainly cannot override your decision unless he were to apply to become your husband's guardian and were appointed by the court. Uh, Without any legal authority to make medical decisions, he is not going to be able to override the decision that you'd made. With respect to the doctor, I would find it difficult to imagine that any doctor would put themselves in a position of uh, removing a, a, a breathing tube after a spouse has indicated that that's something that they would want to have. All right. Good to know. But then again, if you had all of this taken care of, this would not be a question. No matter your age, no matter your circumstances, I think it's important that you get these very simple documents done. Uh, a, a properly drafted and executed healthcare power of attorney and financial power of attorney can save a lot of time, heartache, and, and money in the long run. And I think it's something that's important for everyone to consider doing. Great. Well, thank you for taking such good care of our listeners. Thank you, Pat. I'm happy to help. If you have not taken care of your advanced directives, write this number down and get it done today. Shraff and King. Give them a call at 440-585-1600. They are conveniently located on Psalm Center Road, just south of Route 6 in Willoughby Hills, Ohio. Or visit them online at shraffking.com. I'm Jerry the Germ with a Speak Up and Stay Alive healthcare safety snippet just for you. Here's our expert, Pat Rulo. Hey, Jerry, did you know that people are talking dirty and don't even know it? Think of cell phones and office telephones. Thanks to you, they're covered with thousands of Jerry's just like you. Thousands of people each year miss time from work. Thanks to all of this dirty talk, sanitize your phone daily with a disposable disinfecting wipe and clean your hands every so often with soap and water if possible. Talking dirty isn't nice and it's not healthy. Oh, Jerry, now what are you doing on the bottom of that lady's purse? Listen to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. For more information, go to speakupandstayalive.com. Brought to you by Generation America, the smart and traditional 50-plus membership organization. And they provide a full range of benefits to members. If you're looking for a quality Medicare supplement, their rates are lower than the other 50-plus organization, Generation America. To join and to find out more, visit GenerationAmerica.org. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo, and as part of our Summer Just Got Serious guest lineup, I am so pleased to have this highly regarded and esteemed guest with us today. He is Dr. Peter Pronovost, a world-renowned patient safety champion and a practicing critical care physician. His scientific work using checklists to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections have saved thousands of lives and earned him high-profile accolades, including being named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine, and receiving a coveted MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 2008. Elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2011, Dr. Pronovost is an advisor to the World Health Organization's World Alliance for Patient Safety and regularly addresses the U.S. Congress on Patient Safety Issues. He is Senior Vice President of Patient Safety and Quality and Director of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality at John Hopkins Medicine. And he is here with us today to answer some of your most frequently asked questions. Welcome to our show. Thanks, Pat. It's great to be here. And uh, with those accolades, do you think you could help my kids listen to me a little more? Probably not. (laughs) That's a million-dollar question, right? Exactly. How many children do you have? Uh, Two. A 16-year-old son, uh, Ethan, and a 13-year-old daughter, Emma. Oh, great ages, huh? Yeah, they're fantastic. Oh, well, I'm sure they listen to you. But that's for another show, right? Exactly. (laughs) Well, since this show is all about our listeners, I thought it would be appropriate to reach out to them to write and send their questions for you. So we sent a huge email blast, Facebooked and Twittered your arrival, and we received so many thought-provoking responses. So we'll try to get to as many as we can today. So are you okay with that format? 
That sounds perfect. Jennifer in Atlanta wants to know, as a physician, what got you started in the patient safety movement and how was that perceived and met by your associates and fellow physicians? Yeah, Jennifer, great question. My work in patient safety in many ways began pretty ignobly. When I was a fourth-year medical student at Johns Hopkins, my father was misdiagnosed with a cancer up in Connecticut and died a miserable death. He was writhing in pain, and I was told there was nothing we can do about it, which was just wrong. And I became convinced that patients deserve better than our healthcare system often gives them. I then went on to train in critical care and did a PhD and and uh, was working in safety, but perhaps not as passionate as I should have been until I met the mother of Josie King. Uh, Josie was an adorable little girl who died on a snowy night uh, in her mother's arms after she was taken off life support. And she had been burned and the care team saved her, but one of these catheter infections sacrificed her. And her mother came up to me after her daughter died and said, could you tell me that my daughter would be less likely to die now than in the past? You see, she was worried about what happened to her Her daughter, Josie, might happen to her other daughter. But what I heard her say was not generic, is she safer? She wanted to know, Peter, what are you personally going to do to make healthcare safer? And it was really her challenge that drove us to make a checklist and improve infections because at the time, our rates of infections were really high at Johns Hopkins. And, and I was one of those doctors causing infections. And I certainly didn't want to hurt people. Uh, no clinician does. But I was because I didn't have a good system for it. And so that's really what drove all of our work in her words. Well, I still talk to her all the time where she keeps pushing us to say, is care safer? Are you making a difference? And that's how we got started. So interesting that so many folks that I speak with, that this is how they come into the patient safety movement where something happened to a loved one or to themselves, and then they make it a mission to make sure it doesn't happen to other folks. All right, we have Barry B. Facebook. I'd like to know more about Dr. Pronovo's checklist idea. Does it work outside of the intensive care units? So Barry B., yes, it works all over the place. I mean, we've used it in, in education now. We used it in finance, so even outside of healthcare. And here's the idea. There's so much information out there that it's hard to focus exactly what is the best practices we should be doing. And even if we have practices, they're often worded ambiguously. So you don't walk away from some practice guideline knowing exactly who's going to do what, where, when, and how. And so when we were trying to reduce infections, we went to the Centers for Disease Control guideline. And it's elegant and it was scholarly, but it wasn't very helpful at the bedside because it was over 90 pages it recommended 90 different things, and it didn't prioritize what's most important. So we had the idea to say, hmm, why don't we make a checklist and let's go through this guideline and pick out what's most important. At most, five or seven things. Keep it really simple because I'm a busy clinician. There's no way I'm going to do more than that. Let's word each of these things as a behavior so we're crystal clear about what's expected and then let's look and see how often we're doing those things. So the checklist was relatively simple. It was wash your hands clean your skin with a soap called chlorhexidine, avoid placing catheters in the groin, cover yourself and the patient, and then ask every day if you still need these catheters. When we started, we were doing those things 30% of the time. And then with some system changes and getting doctors and nurses to work better as a team, we got that up to well over 98% and infections virtually disappeared. We've now taken that same approach to pneumonia prevention, to sepsis, to diagnostic errors. We're now actually partnering with the American Medical Association and the CDC to do the same thing that we did in the ICU, but for outpatient blood pressure control, because we know that 200,000 Americans died needlessly from not controlling their blood pressure. And we need to begin to address that in the same systematic approach. So checklists work because they're simple, easy to understand, and they're short. That's exactly right. Well, uh, Pat, great comments. Some of the, what we found is that medicine summarizes evidence in guidelines that are written as if-then statements or, but if this, then do that. But under time pressure, nobody, not doctors, not nurses, not fighter pilots, nobody thinks in conditional probabilities. So what we realize is we can't write this linear list of if this, then this, then that. We had to make each item separate. 
do this, then do that, then do that. And it turns out that it really just worked highly effectively. Now, I would also say, though, it's not only a checklist that we did. A big part of what we did was change the culture of medicine through a program called CUSP. You see, when we first started, even with the checklist, doctors weren't doing, using the checklist all the time, maybe 60, 70 percent. And one of the interventions was to get nurses to work with doctors when they're putting these catheters in. And if the doctors didn't comply with the checklist, the nurse was empowered to stop takeoff. And Pat, when we first suggested that, I literally called World War III in our <laughs> hospital. The, the nurses said, there's no way I'm going to speak up against the doctors. I'll get my head bit off. And the doctor said, hey, you can't have a nurse question me in public. It makes me look like I don't know something, right? And so I, we pulled everyone together and said, is it tenable that we harm patients in this hospital? And everyone says, of course not, Peter. And I said, and do we all agree that the items on this checklist are evidence-based, that they should happen ev to every patient all the time? Yes, of course, Peter, they're from the CDC. Okay, then our egos aren't getting in the way. So docs, we have permission to forget to do something on the checklist. We're human, it's going to happen. But we don't have permission to needlessly put patients at risk. So if you forget, not a worry, but if the nurse sees you or a the patient's family sees you, they're going to correct that mistake and we will go back and make sure the patients get the items on this checklist. And nurses, I know you're worried about getting your head bit off. So docs, let me be very clear. If you give the nurses flack for doing this, nurses page me any time of day or night, you will be supported. Because if you disagree with the evidence, let's have a conversation. But you just told me patients should always get this. So ego can't block delivering patients the care that they deserve. Now, I was never paged, I think because it was framed as a patient safety issue and not a power and politics issue. And we have this culture change now where nurses and doctors are working so much more collaboratively than they had in the past. And that's the kind of uh, healthcare system that we need to create for all. Can we take this a step further and have a culture change maybe where the patients can have a copy of their own checklist? So when the doctor comes in and there's no or there's no nurse to watch over and the doctor walks in, does not wash hands and immediately touches you, shakes his hand, you could say, hey, I've got this checklist. This didn't happen. Yeah, so Pat, you're exactly right. One of the powerful things of checklists is they democratize knowledge. You see, if I use fancy Latin language or I haven't committed to what's supposed to happen, the patients never know. But if we engage them and say, hey, here's the items on the checklist, make sure I do these things. And so not only have we done that, Pat, but we've also made checklists for patients and their families. So now we say, hey, when you go to pick a hospital, ask what their infection rates are, right? If someone walks into your room, ask if they wash their hands if you didn't see them. If you have a catheter or they're going to place one, ask if they're using this checklist. And if the one's in, ask every day if you still need it. That is, you're getting benefit that, exceed, that exceeds the risks. And there's pretty overwhelming data, Pat, that the more we engage patients and their families in their care, the better we're going to be. Now, we're not there yet, in part because my tribe, the clinicians, some of them still don't want to be questioned, and we're working on that in medical school to change the culture so that they welcome being questioned and don't see it as a threat. And for some patients and families, it's scary questioning their clinician. They, they may fear that they're going to be retaliated against. They don't want to offend their doctor. And so we need to work on both sides of this relationship, making patients and their families more comfortable questioning and making those who are being questioned more comfortable with being questioned. But at the end of the day, there's pretty clear data that that's the way we're going to get better outcomes. I agree. And that's the focus of this show is to help empower the patient side from an intelligent standpoint to understand that they have the right to go beyond the ask button. You know, as a patient, we need to know what to ask and then feel empowered and safe in that culture to ask those questions. So I'm glad to hear what it is you're saying. All right. One good question. Eddie in San Diego inquires, how can patients help? Yeah, Eddie, thanks, because we need patients to help. Let me share with you a, a little story, Eddie. There was an astronaut, Rusty Shumter, who was one of the astronauts in the pre-lunar Apollo missions, and he was one of the first people to fly over the Middle East from outer space. And when he came back, he was asked what the Middle East looks like from outer space and what's going on in the world today. His words are so uh, poignant. And Rusty said, what I noticed is there's no lines from out there. Uh, we invent them. They're figments of our imagination. And yet on earth, we kill people over those imaginary lines. 
Mm. And when I think about what we need to do to make progress in safety, we need to erase all those lines that divide us. Lines between patients and dividers, lines between insurers and providers, lines between the private sector and device manufacturers and, and all the rest of us. We all need to work on this together. And so consumers have to be activated. You have to be activated at a policy level, asking for funding for this kind of effort and making and better measures so you could know how safe you are within your states to do the same thing, to make sure that there's accurate reporting and support for this, that there's support for training doctors and nurses in safety. Because right now, most of us go through medical school and nursing school. And even though it's the third leading cause of death, they may not get a course on patient safety. And then we also need, to, when you go to get care at a hospital, your primary care doctor, make sure you question question them about safety and, and their work. And Pat, I'll end with this beautiful idea that kind of guides how we approach this work. And there was a famous physician, uh, Dr. Don Abedian, who was at Michigan, and he was kind of the father of patient safety and quality. And he was dying a few years ago after devoting his life to improving quality. And he was interviewed on his deathbed by one of his former students who asked him, now that you've devoted your life to safety and quality and you're dying, what's the secret to improving the quality of care? And what he said is beautiful. He said, I realize now that the secret of quality is love. If you love your patients, if you love your profession, if you love your God, you can work backwards and fix the system. And I think what we're learning in all of our work is that's exactly right. It starts with this culture change. It starts with focusing on love, inviting elders, not judging them, understanding them and trying to solve this problem. And when we do that, we'll work backwards and fix the system. It's what we did to reduce infections. It's what we're doing now in the ICU to eliminate disrespectful care and all harms. And it's what we all need to do together. So Pat, thanks for your radio show. And I hope you're Listeners, take some action because we have uh, more people dying per year from medical errors, Pat, than died per year in the Civil War. Yeah. And we have to do something about it now. Well, with people like you at the forefront, I think we're going to be making great headway. How can our listeners learn more about you, your work? You have books. How can they find out more? Sure. Great, Pat. I have a book called Safe Patient Smart Hospitals that we chronicle a lot of our work that they may be interested in. They can go to our website called at the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality at Johns Hopkins Medicine. And there's a wealth of training, information, stories. And I also have a blog, Points from Pronovost, that uh, we put ideas out there that we hopefully start a conversation about how we could work on this stuff together. So many ways to get engaged. And the point is that we got to do something. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to visit with us. And, and this is a way to conclude our Summer Just Got Serious guest lineup. We ended with the best. Thank you for taking the time. Sure thing, Pat, and great job. with my friend Hari Kalsa, better known as the healthcare whisperer. In her role as a healthcare advocate and as a family nurse practitioner, Hari knows how to navigate the healthcare system and works with patients all over the country and can help you find the answers you may not get without her. Welcome to the show, Hari. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. Well, today, Hari, let's talk about second opinions. Why should we get one? Well, it's really important to get a second opinion because anytime you get a new diagnosis, diagnosis or a given a new treatment or a medication and you're not really sure what it's all about and you want to just find out some more information, I really think it's important to ask another doctor because you'd be surprised how many doctors disagree on, on treatments. And so it's really important to go and find out if there's any other ways of going about treatment. And I see this a lot with patients, and I tell all my patients, I say, anytime you get a new diagnosis, I'm always saying, go get a second opinion. And go get a second opinion from somebody outside of the practice that your doctor is in, someone completely neutral who doesn't maybe know your doctor or is in a different town, and just have them do a consult. Give them all the information, all your tests, all your papers, 
and ask them what they think, and you'd be surprised what you might find out. Very important, and it just gives you more information to work with, and I think that's really important for patients to have the most information so they can make an informed decision about their care. Absolutely. That is excellent advice. Hari, how can our listeners find out more about you and where can they contact you? Well, they can go to my website at healthcarewhisperer.com. They can contact me at 866-980-4325. They can also find me on Facebook at Hari Kalsa or on Twitter at Hari K108. Well, great. Thank you, Hari, for sharing your wisdom with us today. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and we look forward to your return next week. Oh, great. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And remember to visit Hari at healthcarewhisperer.com. You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. So happy to spend this hour with you to help you survive any healthcare or hospital encounter. And remember, If you like what you hear on this radio show, I speak live and in person, too. In fact, we're even better in person, right, Bob? You better believe it. (laughs) Our presentations are fast-paced, interactive, and chock-full of immediately usable patient safety tips and tools. I can guarantee that your crowd will love it. So email or call me to talk about speaking to your business, your club, church, or hospital. I speak both to the patient side or the provider. Email us at speak at speakupandstayalive.com or call me directly at 440-725-5462. You and your audience will be glad you did. Well, last week we had a loyal listener join us to play everyone's favorite radio game, Are You in Jeopardy? or Are You Safe? And before she left, we asked her to sum up her experience. Listen. So Jerry, What were your first thoughts as we got you on the air to answer some patient safety questions? First of all, what went through my mind is how stupid am I to actually volunteer for this. If you start dressing about that too much, either be hypochondriac. Boy, and that's the truth. You can stress yourself out, just worrying that you're going to get everything that that you hear about. Boy, and that's the truth. Jeopardy. You can stress yourself out. You can stress yourself out. You can stress yourself out. It's it's good not to have um, hair in the way there. (laughs) Boy, and that's the truth. It's hard. So, Jerry, do you have any final comments about your experience today? It, it, It was unbelievably painful. And if you'd like to be considered as a guest contestant on this show, email us at speak at speakupandstayalive.com or call 440-725-5462. Yay, we did good. Yay. <laughs> that was good. It, it, it was unbelievably painful. Well, today we opened the game chamber and everyone decided to play one of our most fave games, Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? Here's how it goes. I will describe a healthcare or hospital associated scene and you, our contestants, have to decide how you would react to the situation. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? Is Don in the booth? He's ready. Okay, here we go. In five, four, three, two, two lights, music. Now entering the studio with today's contestants. Oh, I'm Bob from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I'm a former financial planner. And we have another guest contestant. Who do we have with us? You've got Casey Quinlan, the Mighty Mouse of Mighty Casey Media and author of Cancer for Christmas. Author of Cancer for Christmas. So we've got two great contestants with us today. And we have our dedicated to patient safety listeners from all over the globe. These people will compete today on... Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? All right, you guys ready? Let's go for it. What do you think, Casey? Yep, let's go. All right, here we go. Here's the first scenario. You were recently discharged from the hospital. A few days later, you receive a phone call from the hospital social worker to arrange an in-home visit to assess your surroundings and your progress. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? What do you think, Bob? I think you're in jeopardy. What do you think, Casey? Lacking any other information, I would say that I was in jeopardy because I don't think that I need a home visit. Why am I getting a home visit? Oh, they you... haven't made that clear to me yet. That's good. That's what I was thinking too, Casey. Oh my gosh, you guys are working on threadbare information, but here's what we're thinking. 
Okay. There's a recent two-year study that collected data from approximately 100 patients living independently, but at a high risk for hospital readmission. The experimental group experienced only a 7% readmission rate versus a national high of 30% because the social worker did come by and see them. They're thinking that a social worker can prevent readmissions and the patient's quality of life has improved significantly in the process. I didn't realize that it could actually save the hospital readmission by somebody checking. Oh, I actually do know that uh, because I, I'm a hospital medicine journalist, among many other things. That's true that, uh, that home visits can make a huge difference. But again, you always want to know all the facts in the case before you make any kind of judgment. So I needed more information. So based on the lack of information, I said, I'm not safe. <laughs> well, then I agree with you both. We're going to have to hit the person that wrote these questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Casey. <laughs> All right, we don't hit him too hard. <laughs> oh my God, they're cringing in the other room. All right, here's scenario number two. Let's hope there's enough information. You are a low risk patient in the hospital there for a few days. Every night you are awakened every four hours to check your vital signs. And I guess the key here is you're a low risk patient. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? Hmm. So, Casey here, uh, I would say that you're safe. However, the person that keeps wandering into the room is not because they're running a risk of getting bapped upside the head with something hard. Uh, I don't know, maybe even the um, vent fan, because it really is not smart to wake up a low-risk patient every four hours. They could sleep, and healing uh, happens during sleep. So I'd say, overall, they're not unsafe, but it's not a great plan. I couldn't have said it any better, Casey. That was very good. You guys are awesome. That's right. Hospitals have been checking on vital signs every four hours since 1893, like Florence Nightingale. Yet about 45% of hospital patients belong to that very low risk category. And according to a study which was published online on July 1st in the uh, Journal of Internal Medicine, they say, given what we know about sleep disruptions and how detrimental they are to actual clinical outcomes... We would hypothesize that decreased sleep interruptions in this low-risk patient population would improve outcomes. And this would also free up nursing time for other uh, more critically ill patients. So I think you guys hit that on the head. Yep. Yep. Good going. All right. Here's scenario number three. You are a patient in the hospital. Your nurse attends to you with a sniffle and a raspy throat. She says it could be allergies. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? In I'm jeopardy. She definitely in jeopardy. To work. Yeah, and I mean, if, if it's the kind of thing where she has to be there, you know, for whatever reason, she should be wearing a mask, she should be wearing fresh gloves, you know, fresh mask, fresh gloves every time she goes into a new patient's room. But bottom line, she really should have stayed home. Absolutely, you're both right. Two recent studies provide more proof that healthcare workers should avoid patient care when feeling sick. From November 2009... Through April 2010, researchers collected biweekly nasal swab specimens from 159 physicians, nurses, and staff, and found those folks were working while ill happened to be a routine. And healthcare workers with respiratory symptoms were associated with viral shedding, which can spread the infection. Wow. Yeah. Yep. That's called health worker presenteeism, and it can risk patient safety and employee safety. So uh, w- what would you guys do if, if your health care worker said that they thought it was an allergy? I would ask them to please have somebody I'd, else come in. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd ask them to, at minimum, uh, mask and gloves. And uh, if, if not, just to say, you know, I, I really am not comfortable. I need someone else in here. All right, good, good. Speak up, right? Speak up. Do not be a meat puppet. A meat puppet as... Casey always says. All right, (laughs) here's scenario number four. You go to a doctor whose website touts plastic surgery. You need just a little lift. The website says board certified. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? I would say there is no way to tell because they can be board certified in gastroenterology or board certified in in ear, nose, and otolaryngology something that has nothing to do with surgery or um, you know, that, that level of safety. So board certified is meaningless unless it, unless it is board certified by the American College of Plastic Surgeons. And even then, I would want to see additional learning. I would want to see, you know, I, it, board certified is meaningless. I agree with you. 
it needs to say bird certified for plastic surgery in that realm. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. You're both so right on with that. Some docs out there bill themselves as board certified without specifying the specialty. Remember, we had a, a certified plastic surgeon from Beverly Hills on the show last year who told us about a gynecologist and primary care physicians who added cosmetic procedures to their services and allow the patients to believe that they're board certified in dermatology or plastics. The patient needs to know what they're certified in. And I was really shocked to find that there's no laws in the United States that require doctors to practice only within their specialty fields. The board certification thing is a misnomer, and it's, it really is truly meaningless. So I think that uh, the, the healthcare industry really needs to do a better job policing itself. Yeah. Well, this is good information. And I also read that Texas, California, Louisiana, and Florida were the only four states that mandate that the doctors specify in their advertising which specalty board certifications they have. So mm-hmm. once again, for our listeners, you got to do your homework. You got Indeed. It. Yay. All right. Here's our final scenario. Your child cut himself with scissors. The doctor looks at the cut and announces that all is fine. But then the doctor stops and asks if there is anything else that you wanted to say about the scissors. Is that a good practice? Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? I think you're in jeopardy. Uh, Casey here, a better question for the doctor to ask is what else have these scissors been used for? In other words, if they're kitchen shears and you've been using them to cut chicken and they haven't been through the dishwasher yet, there's stuff that could be on there that could be a risk to your child and might need additional um, disinfection, some additional, say, antibiotic ointments to prevent possibility of infection. The doctor needs to be a little clearer about exactly what he or she is asking. Right. I think the point of that was that at least he asked, because this happened to be a true story that somebody was talking about this new, very new tool called narrative medicine as a way for a physician basically to ask questions. But it turns out in this story that the, the parent was very concerned because they had a boarder that was renting a room in their home who had who was HIV positive and had pre- oh, see, there you go. Yeah, and had yeah. Pre- previously cut himself with the scissors and she was worried that the son could have been exposed to the virus. Now, if this doctor had not asked any more questions and would have just said, hey, it looks fine to me, the mom would have gone home yeah. and nobody would have known. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I find it interesting that they call it a new tool like narrative medicine. But I, in my house, it's always been called conversation. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'm not sure who won that game, but... I think you're all winners because now you know a little bit more about patient safety. So thank you, Bob, for being on the show today. You're quite welcome. And Casey, thank you for joining us. Thank you again for having me. I love it here. Well, we love having you here. And folks, be sure to visit Casey Quinlan's website. Check out her book, Cancer for Christmas. And that is at MightyCasey.com or CancerForChristmas.com. Well, thank you, Don Pardo. And thank you, friends, for playing our newest and our most fun game ever. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? I want the rice roni noodles. What? (laughs) Oh, Bob's always looking to find out what what he wins, right? (laughs) You got it. I'll tell you, that's what you're not winning. You're not winning a room full of Broyhill furniture here, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Besides which, I got enough furniture. Don't need no more. Don't need any more. All right. Don't need more. (laughs) Listeners, don't go anywhere. There's so much more you can learn about healthcare and hospital safety on America's favorite and perhaps only patient safety radio show. Speak up and stay alive. Radio. Radio. No, sorry. Listen while I spend the next two minutes with Chris Alberta, the Medicare supplement partner with Generation America. Chris, today, let's talk about something for free. Everyone loves something free. You offer a free Part D analysis when it comes to the Medicare supplement plans, which is prescription drugs. Can you explain that to us? We have talked to so many Generation America members who have Part D plans that they've purchased in addition to their supplement, which covers no prescription. And what we find over and over again is that somebody is on a plan that really has not been customized to the drugs they're taking. Maybe they bought it because they saw it advertised heavily on television, but in many cases, they're buying it because it's got a cheap premium. Anybody, whether or not they have a supplement or an advantage program through us, can submit their drugs online. We have a beautiful RX portal set up and they'll get back a recommendation for the Part D plan that will cost them the least 
for 2014. That includes the premium, it includes the co-pays, and overall, I see people save $1,500 to $2,000 by being on the right Part D plan. Oh, that's crazy. So no matter whether our listeners have their supplement with you or with someone else, they can contact you. How can our listeners do this? Where should they go? Well, they can log on to generationamerica.org. The boob can be found under the insurance tab, Senior Health Direct, and they just start filling it out. And if they get stuck, they can always call the 800 number that's specific to Generation America, and, and we'll answer and kind of walk them through the process. But it's pretty self-explanatory. Excellent. Do they need to be a member of Generation America to take advantage of this? They don't, but I'll tell you what, I mean, anybody who goes through this process, Pat, and can kind of see the value, I mean, Generation America has gone so far above and beyond what we normally see from advocacy associations, that if they go through this process and save all that money and don't think, man, this is an organization I want in my corner, I'd be shocked. So folks, visit the Generation America website. It's generationamerica.org, or you can reach them by phone, 877 687 4362. Thank you for sharing that with us today, Chris. Hey, no problem, Pat. We'll talk soon. Thank you. You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio, every Saturday morning in Cleveland, Ohio, and in Phoenix, Arizona. I am Pat Rulo, your hostess and author of the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, the Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, available at all of our live speaking events or at our website, speakupandstayalive.com. That's where you can also locate radio show times, dates, and station information. That's speakupandstayalive.com. And if you'd like to purchase the book, but you do not have internet access, it's okay to call me. Lots of folks order the book this way. So give me a call, 440-725-5462. And now, let's take a peek at the Speak Up and Stay Alive calendar. As you know, we offer live speaking events to groups, clubs, organizations, churches, as well as hospital and healthcare related groups. And here's the next one that is open to the public, and therefore you are invited. Our next event will be held this coming Tuesday, September the 24th. I will be the speaker at St. Francis of Assisi Church, located at 6850 Mayfield Road in Gates Mills, Ohio. And that will be at noon. That's where you can also purchase signed copies of my book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, along with other life-saving goodies that we have to offer. Plus, most importantly, I'd love to meet you. These events are always a fun opportunity to get to know my listeners and for them to share some of their stories with me. So mark your calendars for Tuesday, September 24th at noon. And if you would like for me to speak to your group, that would be a great idea. Call me, 440-725-5462 or email me at speak at speakupandstayalive.com. Today, we talked about one woman's heart attack symptoms and how they can be different from what we are accustomed to seeing in the movies. Please, guys and gals, know the symptoms and be prepared. Have an aspirin or two on hand just in case you or a loved one might need it. And our guest, the famed Dr. Peter Pronovost, was so kind to take the time to answer some of your questions. He was a great last guest for our Summer Just Got Serious guest lineup. But just because summer is now over, that doesn't mean our serious guest lineup is through. In fact, I've got some more special experts coming up. You know me. I am serious about patient safety and have a harvest of fabulous fall favorites to share with you. Now, here's a point. If you missed today's show and want to become a full-fledged e-patient, you know e stands for empowered, educated, equipped, it's not too late. You can go to the radio link at the speakupandstayalive.com website and click the link with today's date. That's where you can hear the show again or share it with a friend. That's where you can also purchase the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, The Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide. You know, the friend I mentioned at the beginning of the show who recently had a heart attack told me that thanks to the information in the book, she knew to pack a hospital bag ahead of time. Before she left for the hospital, she told her husband to grab the prepared bag she had stashed in her closet. She also brought a copy of my book, laid it on the tray table in the hospital, and she told me how everyone who entered her room asked about it, opening up the lines of communication. She told me then that the head nurse came in and said to her, I understand there's a book in here I should know about. What a perfect opportunity for my friend to let her and everyone know at a glance and without a word, that she was an e-patient, educated, empowered, and 
eager to stay safe. So if you do not have a copy, I really do encourage you to have one. And let's take a moment to thank all of our radio sponsors and weekly guest experts, because thanks to them, we are here and that helps keep you and me safe. We have Schraff and King, attorneys for all of your advanced planning needs in Willoughby Hills, Ohio. Daryl Hicks, consultant and author of the book, Infection Prevention for Dummies. Generation America, the AARP Alternative. Elizabeth Bailey, author of The Patient's Checklist. And Junction Auto Family in beautiful Chardon, Ohio. Hari Kalsa, the healthcare whisperer. Casey Quinlan, Mighty Casey Media and author of Cancer for Christmas. I really encourage you to support these fine folks. And you can find their information at the speakupandstayalive.com website. Oh, and be sure to listen next week as our guest will be one of our Fall Festival of Friends, our Pick of the Patch professionals, here to share more healthcare and hospital safety tips with you. You'll just have to tune in to see who it is. But one thing is for sure, we'll be raking in the fun. So share this radio program with your friends, your neighbors, your in-laws, your outlaws on Facebook and Twitter, and tell them to cancel all plans. Mark their calendars and set their alarms for when? Oh, you know when? It's next Saturday morning, where you can find us in Cleveland, Ohio, from 7 to 8 Eastern on AM 1420 WHK. And from 9 to 10 Eastern on AM 1220 WHKW. And from 9 to 10 Eastern on AM 1440 WHKZ. Is that right? WHKZ? Okay, WHKZ. Or... You can always listen live via the internet. Check the speakupandstayalive.com website to find out how. Start your week with an O. Speak Up and Stay Alive Patient Safety Radio. In the meantime, I hope you have a healthy and a happy week. I am Pat Rulo, and I am your guide to safe and successful healthcare and hospital encounters. Ta-da! The information provided in today's broadcast is for informational purposes only and was not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem and should not be considered as medical advice. If you've missed part of today's show or just want to share the information with friends, you can listen to all of Pat's previous shows at speakupandstayalive.com. Want even more information? Purchase a copy of Pat's book at speakupandstayalive.com. Once again, it's speakupandstayalive.com. Or you can call Pat at... 440-725-5462. Until next week, remember, it's okay to ask others to wash their hands. You have to speak up and stay alive.